<laughs> Hello everybody, today on It Came From Japan, this, the Toyota Mark II Blit. What is it and why would you want one? Well, find out in today's episode of JM on Cars. The car we have here today is yet another fine example brought to me by the lovely Brad, a rather JDM obsessed fan of the channel who I think to date has brought me about a dozen different vehicles to sample, the vast majority of which are not just Japanese imports but cars that he has organised to be brought over himself. I think what I love most about the cars that Brad brings is they're all the sort of things that you never think of when anyone says JDM. So he's not brought me a Supra, an RX-7, a Celica, a GTO, all that kind of stuff. Instead, he brings me the kind of cars that I expect in Japan may be a relatively common sight, but here certainly are not. In the last few weeks, I have driven his Toyota Blade Master, the V6 powered version of the car that here we called the Auris. And that was hot on the heels of his Toyota Crown Athlete, which at a quick glance is a very similar car to this. Both are large estate cars, but the difference in size between the two is marginal. We're only talking about around that much. Both of them have a version of the venerable two and a half litre six cylinder Toyota 1JZ. If for whatever reason that sounds kind of familiar but you can't place it, the larger 3 litre version, the 2JZ, is what you found under the bonnet of a Mark IV Supra and has become, I think, one of the most iconic combustion engines ever made. The Mark II name was first seen back in 1968. This final generation was introduced in 2001 and ran until 2004, but in estate guise, the Blit, it lasted until 2007. The Crown is a car that I think most people are likely to have heard of, though it wasn't sold globally, us petrol heads have generally seen one, heard of one, or know somebody that's got one. The Mark II though, I think is a rather more unusual thing. I must admit I am struggling to work out exactly what the difference between the two is and likely customers felt the same way because at the end of this car's production the model was discontinued wholesale and in that time both the Mark II itself and its very close relatives were sold under a number of different names, some of which you might know. So alongside the Mark II itself the car was sometimes badged as the Corona, you also had the closely related Cressida and the Cresta as well as at the end the Varosa and the one you are most likely to have heard of the Chaser. Not an identical car to this but a very very close relative and if that wasn't quite confusing enough there is even another version of the crown that sits above it the Majesta. As far as I can see it and Japanophiles please tell me if I'm right or wrong here the Mark II sits a little bit below the crown though you can tell it's still a fairly nice place to be it's certainly not as luxurious as that was. And I have to say, though it is devilishly difficult to decipher, I do have a great degree of admiration for what Japanese manufacturers were doing, particularly in the 90s and early noughties. Before their economy collapsed, it felt like on occasion they wouldn't say no to just about anything, and you had plenty of manufacturers out there that would make multiples of what to most people felt like almost exactly the same car. But as ever, it couldn't last forever, and the combination of a recession along with the introduction of stricter emissions regulations meant that by the late 2000s the party was over. The Supra was axed, the NSX was gone, the RX-7 discontinued, and even Subaru gave up on making the four-door saloon variant of the Impreza WRX. Sad times indeed. Fortunately, the last few years has seen something of a revival in the interesting Japanese car, spearheaded, I think really, by Toyota, whose wonderful chairman Akio is a proper petrol head. But the big problem for members of the Gran Turismo generation like myself is the fact that because these cars have now become so revered, they are also becoming somewhat inaccessible. Stuff that 15 years ago you could have picked up for 10 grand might now be 100.
But happily, it's not all bad news for those bitten by the JDM bug. If anything, I think this is the perfect car to appeal to the sort of person that is thinking of a Subaru Legacy, maybe even an Outback, or something along those lines. You have your 1JZ engine up front, making 193 horsepower but it's connected to an all-wheel drive system, giving you that year-round practicality that I'm sure some people need. Unfortunately, it is also connected to a four-speed automatic gearbox. I am fairly certain that this ubiquitous and, to be honest, fairly smooth four-speed would be a deal-breaker for some, but unfortunately, I'm not actually sure how many of these were offered with a manual. I know the Mark II did have one, but I'm not sure that it was offered for every engine. In fact, I'm certain the 1JZ GTE, the turbo, wouldn't have had it because that was how it was sold in just about everything bar the Supra. Provided that ultimate performance isn't your concern, there is a lot to be said for this car. And of course, we had to start with that engine. Sure, at 193 horsepower and without a turbocharger, it's likely not the 1JZ of your dreams. But that doesn't stop it being an engineering marvel. As with just about all inline sixes, it is buttery smooth. It makes a good amount of power and torque throughout the rev range. And in fairness, that 193 horsepower would be actually about the same as you would have got from a 2.5 or 2.8 litre BMW 6 of the time. The gearbox then has a nice friendly lever over here and the obligatory switch, allowing you to change it from normal to snow or power mode. This car is driven almost exclusively in power mode and honestly it does make it a little better. It holds onto the gears a little longer and makes it just a slightly more pleasant experience. Though you can sense it's not quite as upmarket as the Crown, there's still quite a few nice touches in here, including the swing button, which makes the air vents oscillate, which I quite like. This has also had an aftermarket air ionizer fitted, because likely one of the previous owners was a smoker, and this makes sure that the cabin smells nice and lovely, regardless of who is in it or what they're up to. The back then also has some lovely touches. First off, because the car has been styled with a fairly squared off rear, unlike many modern sporty looking estates, it's a decent size, even before you folded the rear seats, which themselves go nearly flat, giving you, should you need it, proper IKEA load lugging ability. The parcel shelf itself is also nice, very slick to use, and is one of those little touches that reminds you Toyota do take care with just about everything. As does the fact when you lift the floor of the boot, it's got a little hook so you can keep it up should you need it, and below that you have apparently not just a spare parcel shelf, for whatever reason, but also a Toyota Blit specific foldable storage box. <laughs> I don't know why, but you've got it. It's lovely. Ride comfort is decent. I would say it's a, a little firmer setup than that in the Crown, but the theory is that should make it a touch sportier. So does it? Well, let's switch down a gear and find out. There is no exhaust poking out the back of the car, so I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with my blatherings instead. To be honest, it doesn't really make all that much noise anyway in standard guise. Although, that being said, when it does get to about 4,000 RPM, you get this lovely induction noise in the cabin. Oh, that's quite special, that. Uh, I love these engines. One day, I got to own one of these. It has to be done. I'm sure a lot of people would be tempted to put a pipe on it, but you know, I like the fact that Brad brings these over relatively unmolested and then keeps them that way. Foot down, the car is keen enough to change, pulls nicely towards the top end of the rev range. The steering is a little on the slow side, but it's still quite well judged. Deals with the lumps and bumps fairly well. I can hear the parcel shelf rattling just a, a little bit, but other than that, the interior is pretty solid. Filled as ever with the very typical late 90s, early noughties Japanese materials that <laughs> I am falling for. I love these so much. Every time I get in the sleeker, I just go, yeah, there's something about them. Maybe it's because my granddad had a fifth gen sleeker when I was younger, but I've just got this beautifully nostalgic association with Japanese cars of this era. Yeah, it does a decent enough job. I, I quite like it. I'm not sure whether the 1JZ GTE powered version was actually any sportier in terms of suspension setup, but to be honest, 
this is just not the car you buy if that's your sort of bag. Instead, see this more like a JDM Volvo and it'd make a lot of sense. I haven't really talked about the styling though, have I? And that's because, well, it's weird, isn't it? If you told me that somebody had had this coach built, i.e. there never was a Mark II estate and somebody wanted one, I'd believe you. That massive C pillar, absolutely vast, makes it look like they've just taken a saloon and kind of plonked a body on the back. It's, it's bizarre. It does get in your way as well in terms of visibility indicators on the right as I would expect them of anything Japanese. How's the turning circle? Uh, it's okay, it's not great. Gearbox is quite nice to use, I have to say that. I know it's old-fashioned but it does work and when you want to pull away at a junction, smooth, responsive, <sighs> lovely. The driver's seat is electric, the rest are not but comfy enough actually a little more sculpted than I would have expected too it's holding me in quite well this brakes they're decent enough quite a long pedal travel not too firm but suits the kind of character of the car the steering is very much the same it's slower than you expect a little lighter than you expect but it does have just a little bit of feel in it it'll be hydraulic I'm sure and I like that a lot it's easy to place too because you can see a lot more of that bonnet than you might expect. It's still fairly narrow. The rear of the car also is basically the rear hatch, so for reversing it's not too much of a trouble. And you have a little button down here which says up, auto, down. And if you press that, it'll make the little parking stick over there poke up, allowing you to see exactly where that corner of the car is. And I really appreciate that. So, in conclusion, I think the fairest thing to say about this car is that it's another, much like the Crown, where, though I could understand most people just wanting to buy something they could get here, 5 Series, E-Class or the like, it is still a decent package and it has that JDM thing going for it, which if that's worth something to you, then it should be a car that's worth buying. But how much are you going to pay for one? Well, that's the tricky thing because the fact is, Brad bought this car quite a long time ago. So even though I could tell you what he paid, that wouldn't actually be an accurate number anymore. An example with the Turbo GTE went for about £14,000 recently. One of these with the naturally aspirated engine will always command a fair bit less. People are always happy to pay for a GTE. I would say, in reality, you could probably get one of these for somewhere between five and ten thousand pounds. And that actually will put it in line with many of these other cars of the era. And hopefully, because they are a somewhat overlooked vehicle that not many people consider, they're also likely to be in a slightly better condition. Many 5 Series of this vintage I know have had hard lives because they were cheap ways to get into something relatively powerful and rear-wheel drive so they appealed to the drift crowd. They also will be suffering from the usual corrosion issues, so on and so forth, that hopefully these won't be seeing in quite the same way. I won't say that it's going to be corrosion free, because that simply isn't true. There is this great misconception that everything coming over from Japan is perfect, immaculate, and has been well cared for its entire life. That simply is not the case. However, if you buy wisely and through the correct channels, then you should certainly be able to get a car that is of a decent standard. In fact, lately, I have noticed that there are lots of other cars, for example, Volvos and Mercs, which people are now importing from Japan, despite the fact you could get them here. And the reason is that they are in better condition. They also tend to come fitted with random, weird and slightly nutty Japanese goodies that I've got to say, I am a sucker for. So then, that's a look at the rather unusual Toyota Mark II Blitz. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and if you happen to know a little bit more about either the Blitz or the Mark II in general, please hop into the comment section and share it with the rest of the class. I'd love to know a little bit more about it and understand it just that little bit better. But in any case, the only other thing I need to say is a big thank you as ever to Brad for bringing his car out and to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.